Okay, hello and welcome to this next part of electrochemistry, uh, where we will be talking about redox titrations. So these are kind of ways of determining the amount or presence of a substance uh, which undergoes an oxidation or reduction reaction, of course, um, using a titrometric method. Um, so it might have been some time since you've done titrations. So I'll do a bit of a recap of just simple acid base titrations and what goes on there because they're not totally dissimilar. So uh, redox titration uh, are titrations based on an oxidation reduction reaction between an analyte and a titrant. So this means that what we're doing is we're adding the uh, titrant to, which is the thing in the burette usually, um, to something in a beaker. And what's happening is that as we add it, a reaction is happening. Um, this reaction is a redox reaction, which is an oxidation reduction reaction. If we recall that oxidation is the loss of electrons, reduction is the gain of electrons. It's really a, an electron transfer process. So um, as a result, the, the reaction can be followed. Um, there is a potential developed, and so that can be measured. Um, so whereas in things like um, uh, acid-base type titration, we were looking at the reaction of an acid with a base to produce a salt and water. In this, we are seeing the transfer of um, electrons. So some common oxidants and reductants that we might use depending on um, what species uh, is our analyte and some common oxidants to use might be chlorine, might be hypochlorite, might be atomic oxygen, oxygen, ozone, or hydrogen peroxide. The ones that are probably the easiest to use in the lab are the hydrogen peroxide and the hypochlorite, although you can bubble oxygen and chlorine through in a different type of redox titration. Um, some reductants are ascorbic acid, uh, borohydride, ferrous, um, which is just iron 2 plus, uh, tocopherol, which is um, vitamin E, whenever it's alpha tocopherol. Uh, we have sulfur dioxide and we have sulfites. So these are just some common reductants and some common oxidants. Remember that if something is a reductant, that means it's going to be oxidized, which means it's going to lose electrons. And if something is an oxidant, that means it itself is going to be reduced or it is going to gain electrons. And oftentimes you can like, even if you're not totally familiar and you can't totally remember, um, sometimes figuring it out, the species is not so horrendously difficult. Uh, what I mean by that is like, we typically look at the species, like if, we've, if we know what's a redox titration, first of all, we can look at the species involved. And like, for example, chlorine, um, we can say that, you know, chlorine likes to form chloride ions. It's in group seven. So gaining an electron is advantageous for that. This is just going back. This is not even like anything we've learned in electrochemistry. This is literally going back to like general chemistry and the formation of ions. But um, if we think about chlorine, um, it's just something that wants to gain electrons or lose electrons. Um, losing electrons makes a chlorine plus. That's not something we're totally familiar with. Um, whereas gaining an electron being reduced, that means it goes from chlorine to chlorine minus. That's a chloride ion. I've heard of chloride ions. That seems reasonable. Um, so that means it, if, if it gains an electron, that's a reduction, which means it would be an oxidant. Um, same thing can be done for oxygen. Oxygen typically forms oxide ions, which are O2 minus. Um, doesn't typically form uh, positively charged ions. I mean, it is possible, but it's not something which is energetically favorable. And some others are, are more complex, like uh, hypochlorite and hydrogen peroxide, but some are, are reasonably, um, we can use our chemical intuition there, um, but that's not always possible, like uh, unfortunately. So as I said, um, it might've been a long time since we did titrations. Um, so we'll just do a quick recap of what a titration is in terms of acids and bases. Um, before we move on to redox titrations, which by and large are quite similar uh, in their sort of interpretation, but um, obviously involve oxidation reduction, oxidation uh, reduction reactions as opposed to acid base neutralization reactions. So um, we'll do a strong acid, strong base titration, which is the simplest form um, and the form which is most similar to the kind of redox titrations you might encounter. Um, 
So we'll be asking what happens when we add a strong base to a solution of a strong acid. So acid-base titrations, um, in an acid-base titration, the concentration of an acid or a base is determined by neutralizing the acid or base with the solution of base or acid of known concentration. Basically, you add, if it's an acid, you add base. If it's a base, you add acid. Um, because in acid-base titrations, you're trying to find the concentration of the unknown. The unknown is the analyte in the beaker at the bottom of the burette, uh, where the burette feeds in the titrant of known concentration. Well, at least one of the solutions have to, has to have a known concentration. Um, and then in the case of redox, react, redox titrations, what we're doing is we're adding a, an oxidant or reductant to our analyte species, and then uh, we're monitoring it as the, the potential changes in the system. And we'll, 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 of course, see examples of that as we go through. Um, so the equivalence point of the reaction occurs when the number of moles of hydroxide added equals the number of moles of hydronium originally present or vice versa. So the equivalence point is the point at which all of the hydroxide has reacted with all of the hydronium, all of the base has reacted with all of the uh, acid in this acid-base uh, titration where we're adding a base to an acid. And the end point occurs when the indicator changes color if we have an indicator. Usually in redox titrations, we don't have an indicator. Um, we just use the, um, the potentiometer that will be attached to our experimental setup to try and interpret when the endpoint occurs. And so in, in an acid-base titration, the indicator should be selected so that its color change occurs at a pH close to that of the equivalence point. So um, in a strong acid, strong base titration, the titration is the addition of a strong base to a solution containing a strong acid. Strong base, something like sodium hydroxide. Strong acid, something like hydrochloric acid. Remember that strong acids and bases dissociate completely in water. And overall, the reaction is therefore going to be a proton plus hydroxide gives us um, water. And the conjugate ions are spectators and do not interfere with the titration. So this is what it looks like whenever we have a strong acid-base titration. And it's actually very reminiscent of what we will see when we come to see a redox titration. This is a graph of pH change over um, the volume of base added to our uh, hydrochloric acid in this case. Um, we have here initially the pH is uh, quite low because we have concentrated hydrochloric acid. Um, and then as we go through, we reach an equivalence point here, which is pH 7. So it's always pH 7 for a strong acid, strong base titration. Um, at this point, there is no acid present, there is no base present, which is why we have a neutral solution. And then if we continue to add more base, we end up with a more basic solution. So this is similar to the redox titration, where initially we'll either have an excess of our species to be oxidized, or we will have an excess of our oxidant. And then the pH instead will be a P oxidant or P reductant, um, and so on. So the volume of uh, sodium hydroxide added um, is given here, and this is the pH change. So you can follow it even if you just want to look at a table of data. And here, the images here are shown that um, what the, the sort of solution looks like if we were to um, put a microscope on it or something like that. So initially, we start off with an acidic system where we have a totally dissociated acid and base. We have the chloride ions. We have the uh, protons from the acid uh, attached to water to give hydronium ions. As we move through, we, we see the presence now of fewer hydronium ions, and we also see some sodium ions in solution. And then as we keep going to the equivalence point, we'll get to a point where there is no um, hydronium ion and there is no hydroxide ion that's visible. And so we'll just end up with a salt, which is sodium chloride and water. And if we keep adding base, we'll eventually get to a point where we have excess sodium ions and excess hydroxide ions. So the initial pH is low, the pH rises very rapidly at the equivalence point, which occurs at pH 7. So this is here, which is where they put their, um, what do you call this? Indicator. 
And then eventually the pH increases gradually when uh, excess base has been added. So um, it's important, like, so to make this easier to transition to the redox, uh, it's important to realize that pH stands for uh, the log uh, minus log to the base 10 concentration of H plus ions, hydronium ions. And so that's going to be important when we look at this, when we go through to the oxidation reduction react or titrations, because we'll be looking at P of like, for example, silver or P of copper or P of iron, that kind of thing. Um, because remember, P is just a, an indicator of minus log to the base 10. And we'll be dealing with concentrations of other species. So as the concentration of hydronium ions decreases, we see that um, more base has been added. So we can calculate that using this. So hydronium ions uh, concentration is going to be equal to the initial HA concentration. Um, and that's because of um, the fact that it totally dissociates. And then this other part here, which I said was important, which is pH is equal to minus log to the base 10 of the hydronium ion concentration. So finding the pH, which remember is the concentration of the hydronium ions before the equivalence point. So that's in the acid rich region. We have an initial moles of um, hydronium ions, which is equal to the volume times the concentration of the acid. So the amount of acid that we have in the bottom times the moles of acid, and then which was uh, the molarity of the acid, which was 0 0.1 moles per liter. Then uh, we have the moles of hydroxide added, which is the volume of base times the concentration of base, which conveniently was also 0 0.1 moles per liter. Um, then to find the number of moles of hydronium remaining, we simply subtract the initial number of moles, uh, or subtract, sorry, the amount of hydroxide added from the initial number of moles. And so we end up with um, the concentration of hydronium ion being equal to the moles of hydronium ions remaining over the total volume of the solution, which is the initial volume of the acid and then the volume of any base that has been added. And then of course, pH is equal to minus log to the base 10 concentration of the hydronium ions. At the equivalence point, pH is equal to seven for a strong acid base, strong uh, base titration. So all of the acid and all of the base have reacted to literally just give us salt plus water. Now, beyond this, we're going to have excess hydroxide because we're not adding any more acid, but the acid that we have initially is, has been reacted with and has been used up. So the initial moles of hydronium ions, of course, is equal to the same thing. It's the volume times the concentration. Then the moles of hydroxide added is equal to the volume times the concentration of the base. Um, and then, so the excess moles of hydroxide is going to be the number of moles of hydroxide added. So it's going to be from this um, minus the initial moles of hydronium, which we, we calculated here, but we could also have calculated on the previous slide. Now, the hydroxide ion concentration is equal to the moles, uh, excess moles of hydroxide over the volume of acid plus base. And then the POH is equal to minus log to the hydroxide concentration. And the pH then is equal to 14 minus pOH. Now, this is for pH measurements and for acid base titrations. But um, the, you'll see, hopefully, when if we go on to the redox titrations shortly, that uh, by and large, this, the process is pretty similar. It's still just a titration. It's just this is our first um, kind of encounter of these things. So here is a bunch of example calculations. So in the previous example, we had 40 milliliters of 0.1 molar HCl titrated with 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide. And then the pH is simply the pH of the hydrochloric acid solution. So the hydronium ions concentration is going to be equal to the initial concentration of HCl, which is going to be equal to 0.1 moles per liter um, and the pH then is going to be equal to this, pH 1. Uh, to calculate the pH after 20 milliliters of sodium hydroxide solution has been added. So we're going to need to know how many moles of um, sodium hydroxide there are in 20 milliliters of solution. And we're also going to need to know how many moles of acid there are in the 40 milliliters that existed in the beaker. So the initial moles of hydronium is equal to 0 0.04 liters because it was 40 milliliters, but we need that in liters because our concentration here is moles per liter. So it's 0 0.04 times 0 0.1 over 1, um, which is equal to 4 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of hydroxide, or sorry, sorry hydroxide, hydronium. Then the hydroxide added is going to be equal to 0 0.02 
liters, which is 20 milliliters of sodium hydroxide solution times the concentration of this sodium hydroxide solution, which is going to be equal to 2.0 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of hydroxide. So we now have our initial moles of uh, hydronium. We have our added moles of hydroxide. So we can find now the um, remaining moles of hydronium. And this is because hydronium reacts one-to-one -one with hydroxide to form water. And so um, the OH minus ions react with an equal amount of H3O plus ions. So we end up with this many hydronium ions remaining. Um, and so the concentration is going to be equal to um, the number of moles of hydronium remaining divided by the total volume of the system, which is the initial 40 milliliters of the acid plus the 20 milliliters added of the base. So that's going to be 60 milliliters. Um, so it's two times 10 to the minus three divided by 60 milliliters is going to be 0 0.0333 moles per liter. Put that into our pH calculation and we find that the pH is not increased from one to 1.48. Still pretty low, but less um, acidic than it was before. So then the equivalence point occurs when the moles of hydroxide added is equal to the initial moles of hydrochloric acid. So when 40 milliliters of sodium hydroxide has been added, in this case, since both our solutions have the same concentration, both are 0 0.1 moles per liter. To calculate the pH after 50 milliliters of sodium hydroxide solution has been added, what we see is that the hydroxide ion added is equal to 0 0.05 liters of sodium hydroxide times 0 0.1 moles over one liter, which is equal to five times 10 to the minus three moles of hydroxide. Now the hydroxide ions added in excess is equal to five times 10 to the minus three, minus four times 10 to the minus three, which was the initial number of moles of our hydronium. Um, so that means that we have an excess of one times 10 to the minus three moles of hydroxide. So the hydroxide ion concentration then is equal to one times 10 to the minus three moles, which is the uh, excess moles of the hydroxide ion divided by the total moles of the, or total volume of the solution, sorry, which is the initial 40 milliliters of acid plus the added 50 milliliters of base. So that's going to be 90 milliliters in total. And then that's going to be equal to 0 0.011 moles per liter of hydroxide ion concentration. Plug that into our POH calculation. We get a POH of 1.95 pretty basic and we find out that the pH is around about 12.05 that's a very reasonably basic solution okay so that was a brief 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 overview of acid based titrations and really only covering strong acid based titrations we didn't cover anything to do with weak acid based titrations because they're not really as relevant in our understanding of redox titrations so again, redox titrations are based on an oxidation reduction reaction between the analyte and the titrant. So instead of it being an acid-base acid -base reaction, we now have an oxidation reduction reaction. And here are some of those oxidants and reductants that we talked about at the start. So um, here is what a kind of typical setup for uh, redox titration might look like. So we have here the burette containing the um, either the oxidant or the reductant, depends on what kind of redox titration we've set up. Um, this is analogous to the acid or base being in the burette. So the concentration of this should be known. Um, then the analyte is going to be in the beaker at the bottom. The difference here is that instead of having an indicator, what we do have is a potentiometer so that we can measure the change in potential in the solution as we add our titrant. So we're considering the titration of iron 2 plus with a standard cerium 4 plus uh, monitored potentiometrically with platinum and calomel electrodes. So we have here the calomel reference electrode, the saturated calomel electrode, we have here platinum wire, and we have here at the bottom a magnetic stirring bar to just keep the solution ticking over and stirring. So the titration reaction then is going to be cerium 4 plus plus iron 2 plus goes to cerium 3 plus plus iron 3 plus. Um, I'd like if you could maybe indicate to me which one you think is the oxidant in this reaction. So which one is going to cause the oxidation? So which one is going to be itself reduced? 
Okay, so um, thank you for those answers. Um, the oxidant in this instance is going to be the cerium 4 plus because the cerium 4 plus is reduced to form cerium 3 plus. So whenever I ask for the oxidant, I want to basically want to know which species is reduced because it's the one that's going to affect the oxidation in some other species. So you are correct if you say that iron 2 plus is oxidized, that is correct. It goes from iron 2 plus to iron 3 plus, so that is also correct. But it is not the oxidant, it's actually the reductant. So that means it is being oxidized. So it is transferring electron. It's a little bit, the terminology can be a little bit confusing at sometimes. But in order for something to be an oxidant, it needs to remove an electron from somewhere else. So um, it goes from cerium 4 plus to cerium 3 plus, so it is reduced. And consequently, the iron is oxidized, going from iron 2 plus to iron 3 plus. So at the platinum indicator electrode, two reactions come to equilibrium. We have the iron 3 plus plus an electron going to iron 2 plus with this standard potential. And we have the cerium 4 plus plus an electron going to cerium 3 plus with this standard potential here. So um, again, um, in our titration curve, we have several regions. We have the region before the equivalence point. So um, that's the in the acid-base titration that we did, where we had a strong acid in our solution. That was the a low pH region, so the acidic pH region, so it was before the equivalence point. Then at the equivalence point, um, we're also going to have an equivalence point, and then after that as well. So before the equivalence point, we can use either a, an indicator half reaction to determine the voltage. Uh, before the um, equivalence point, we know that the constant, we know the concentration, sorry, of iron two plus and iron three plus. How do we know that? Well, we know the initial concentration um, based on the potential of the uh, solution. And we know the um, iron three plus concentration because of the amount of iron, uh, the amount of cerium that we've added. So the system's overall potential is equal to the potential at the positive terminal minus the potential at the negative terminal. So um, based on this, we can then develop two Nernst equations. So as, as we've seen before for our overall potential of, a, of just a galvanic cell, um, where we have uh, the reference electrode here, which is our saturated calomel electrode, which is going to be E minus. And then we have the, um, the potential um, for the um, oxidation of the iron 2 plus to the iron 3 plus. Um, so that's going to be um, the standard potential for that reduction uh, minus uh, the Nernst uh, sort of um, term over one. This would be over n, but since the number of electrons transferred is one, it's just over one. So we omitted that times 10 or times log to the base 10 of the quotient between the iron 2 plus and the iron 3 plus. Um, so then we end up with um, E, the potential for our total system being 0 0.526 uh, minus uh, this term here, which is dependent on the concentration of the two species, both the oxidized and the reduced form. So um, the point at which the volume is equal to half the equivalence volume, so like we're halfway to having, um, in this case, oxidized all of the iron 2 plus to iron 3 plus, uh, is analogous to the point at which pH is equal to pKa in an acid-base titration. So E plus is equal to the standard potential for the iron three plus, iron two plus couple. At the equivalence point though, um, we have exactly enough cerium four plus has been added to react with all of the iron three plus. So that means that the cerium three plus, or sorry, react with all of the iron two plus. So this all the cerium three, the cerium three plus concentration is equal to the cerium uh, iron three plus and the cerium four plus is equal to the iron two plus. At the equivalence point, both, okay, so I am, I'll explain that a bit more. So um, what's happened here is that uh, the reason why these concentrations are equal is because at the equivalence point, we have added a total molar quantity of cerium, which is equal to the total molar quantity of iron, irregardless of their oxidation states. Just the amount of cerium and the amount of iron added are the same. When the amount of iron is static, it's always the same in the solution because we're not adding or taking any away. The oxidation states may be changing, but iron the, as an element is still present. 
then cerium as an element has been added in a certain concentration. So this cerium as an element um, will react, of course, with the iron. And so what happens is uh, we end up with the cerium three plus concentration equal in the iron three plus concentration, because they're on the same side of the um, equilibrium. And then the cerium four plus and the iron two plus are also on the same side of the equilibrium. And so their concentrations are going to be the same as well at the equivalence point. So at the equivalence point, the half reactions are in equilibrium with the platinum electrode at the equivalence point, and it is convenient to use both of them. So we've got um, at that point, we've got E plus is equal to 0 0.767 minus 0 0.05916 times the log to the base 10 of the quotient for this um, reaction. So the same thing for the cerium, same thing here. Um, so then because the cerium three plus concentration is equal to the iron three plus concentration and cerium four plus is equal to iron two plus, um, the cell voltage becomes this, where the potential is equal to the positive terminal minus the negative terminal, which is the calomel reference electrodes is the oxidation, is equal to 1.23 minus 0 0.241, which gives us um, this voltage here. So this comes from these up here. So after the equivalence point, so at this point, we're basically just adding more and more cerium. So this is kind of analogous to the point in the acid, in the basic, um, in the basic region of the um, acid-base titration, where we kept adding more and more hydroxide and we continuously got higher and higher pHs. But in this case, um, we're really just changing the concentration of the cerium, and the cerium concentration continually increases. So um, after the equivalence point, the moles of cerium three plus is equal to the moles of iron three plus. This is because um, after all of the iron two plus has uh, been uh, oxidized to iron three plus, there's no more um, iron two plus for the cerium four plus to react with. So that means that we won't be adding any more cerium 3 plus. Everything that we add in excess is going to be unreacted cerium 4 plus. So because the concentration of cerium 3 plus and cerium 4 plus are known, cerium 3 plus is known from the equivalence point, having all reacted with iron 3 plus. And cerium 4 plus concentration is known because we know how much we've added in excess. So then that means it is convenient to use this half reaction here um, for the total cell potential. So again, these are just individual Nernst equations for the two, two parts. Um, we have um, this part for the cerium, uh, where we have the cerium standard potential, and then this term for the concentration of the, um, the added cerium 4 plus, and then the remaining cerium 3 plus, and then this is the saturated calomel electrode here. So um, how do we do some of these calculations? So we saw the example calculations for the acid base titration. So let's do this then for the um, redox titration. So um, we're set up with this, this question. So 100 milliliters of 0 0.0500 moles per liter iron two plus is titrated with 0 0.100 moles per liter cerium four plus using the setup we saw earlier. The equivalence point is when the volume of cerium four plus is equal to 50 milliliters. Calculate the cell voltage at these different um, added volumes of cerium four plus, 36.0 milliliters, 50.0 milliliters, and 63.0 milliliters. So this is going to be before the equivalence point since it's less than 50 milliliters. It's gonna be at the equivalence point since it's equal to 50 milliliters. And it's gonna be beyond the equivalence point since it's 63 milliliters. Now, what we see here is the, the titration curve. So here we have the potential, um, which is what we're measuring as opposed to the pH. And then we have the volume of cerium added. So the shape, hopefully you can see, is, is reasonably similar to that of the strong acid, strong base titration. Um, and so that should hopefully give you an indication of the kind of calculations we might do. Um, if you remember the recap we did at the start, or even if you remember as far back as previous um, analytical and instrumental chemistry classes. Um, 
So how is the equivalence volume 50 milliliters? Well, it's really just looking at how many moles of iron two plus there are here. So it's gonna be 100 milliliters times the molarity. And then that will give us a certain number of moles. Then we multiply that certain number of moles, or sorry, we then use that number of moles combined with the concentration of cerium to find out the volume that needs to be added. Um, because remember we have our, oh. so moles, is equal to volume times concentration. So we can rearrange this to get volume where volume is equal to moles divided by concentration. And so put in values, rearrange equations, and we'll get to 50 milliliters like that. Okay, so we'll do the first one then. Um, we'll have a look at the calculating the cell voltage at 36 milliliters added of cerium four plus. So the solution then is that this is 36 out of 50 of the way to the equivalence point. So if the equivalence point is 50 milliliters, then 36 milliliters is what? 36 divided by 50, about 72% of the way to the um, equivalence point. So at that point, 72% um, of the iron two plus is now iron three plus. And that means that 14, uh, so 28% then is iron two plus. And so that means that the quotient of iron two plus to iron three plus is going to be 14 over 36. And that means that we can then plug that into our values here. So we didn't actually need to do any calculations. I mean, you could calculate through and get concentrations and so on, but really a quotient is just a ratio between the, uh, the distribution of the concentrations. So if we know that ratio, it doesn't matter what units they're in, like it could be concentration, it could just be like here, we're just using numbers and percentages. So long as we've got consistency and so long as we've done, um, the the correct processes it, it's okay to do it like this so we're just literally looking at the ratio of concentrations or the ratio of the the fractions uh put in the uh, standard reference potential um which we didn't give in the question but we saw in an earlier slide in a, in a question you would be given that um the standard potential then this is the nernst part based on concentration so we find out that the um, potential at the um, anode is going to be, um, or sorry, the cathode is going to be 0 0.791 volts. So this is the reduction potential here. So that's at 36 um, milliliters added of um, cerium four plus. And so we can see that that is generally increasing our, what do you call this? Increasing our um, potential. So this potential is not the same as the point over here. So like you might say like, well, we've added 36. So shouldn't we be at like five point something, but we're only at seven, or, but we're much beyond that 0 0.791. Remember that the uh, potential, this is the potential for the whole cell. So we have to subtract from this, our standard potential. This is not the final answer. Um, the final answer is here where the potential of the system is equal to the, the, the potential of the positive terminal, which is what we've just worked out, minus the potential of the standard or the saturated calomel electrode, which is equal to 0 0.791 minus 0 0.241, which is equal to 0 0.550 uh, volts. That's as the potential for the total system after 36 milliliters of cerium four plus has been added. Then I will do it at the equivalence point. So uh, that's 50 milliliters. So since the cerium four plus constant or cerium four plus plus iron two plus gives cerium three plus plus iron three plus, so that's the reaction that we're using here for our titration. All ions are in the form of cerium three plus and iron three plus at the equivalence point. So that means that we have two different um, Nernst equations at the um, positive terminal. We have one for the iron here. And we have one for the cerium where we've got the re standard uh, reduction potential for both. And then we've got this term based on the concentration of the two species. So um, we have here the, uh, what's it called? The, oh yeah, so basically we add them together and get two E plus. So we have here, because we'll need to get the average. So 
Um, we have here two E plus is equal to the two reference potentials of the two species, and then the two concentration dependent terms. And um, we can combine these together like so. Uh, this is a property of logs of the, the way that you can add together their, um, the part that you're analyzing. I can't remember the mathematical term for that. Um, and then um, we fill in the values that we know. Uh, and so since because the concentration of cerium 3 plus and iron 3 plus and cerium 4 plus and iron 2 plus are at the equivalence point, so that's they're equal to each other at the equivalence point, the ratio of concentrations is unity, meaning the log term is going to be zero. Um, yeah, so like there is no iron 2 plus. Um, so since all of these, this, this is equal to this and this is equal to this, we end up with this all equaling one. Um, and then we end up with this term here. So we end up just cutting this out um, because of the, the being at the equivalence point, these concentrations are equivalent. So we end up with two times the um, potential at the positive attached to the positive terminal is equal to 2.467 volts which gives us um, an E plus of 1.23 volts. We have to divide this by two. Since it's two E plus, we have to divide this by two. We get E plus is equal to 1.23 volts as the potential at that terminal. Then of course, remember, we still have to use the standard Calomel uh, reference electrode here or saturated Calomel reference electrode. So E is equal to E plus minus E Calomel is equal to 1.23 minus 0 0.241 gives us the potential of the cell of 0 0.99 volts. So the potential is continuously increasing as we add more and more cerium. Okay, um, then um, I've omitted the other one, but basically you would work out beyond the, uh, for the 63 milliliters, um, the concentration beyond the, uh, what do you call this? Beyond the um, equivalence point. So you would expect to see a much higher, um, potential. So finding the endpoint. So a uh, redox indicator changes colors when going from its oxidized to its reduced state. Um, so uh, here we can see a kind of example of this. So this iron three plus is complexed by this uh, organic species here, which has got two nitrogens and then three conjugated rings attached to it. So those conjugated rings, um, if we were call from UV vis spectroscopy probably have an absorption, which means that the solution is probably colored. And in this case, it is uh, colored. Um, so it's pale blue in color whenever we have iron three plus. But if we reduce the iron three plus to iron two plus, we find out that the color changes from blue to red. And so that can be a very good indicator of the redox reaction having been completed or having gone through. And so the color change will occur over the range where um, E is equal to um, the standard potential plus or minus the um, this Nernst concentration term um, over N, where N is the number of electrons in the reduction reaction. So in this case, it would be one. So it would be the standard potential plus or minus this. So the range is usually quite small, um, but basically that's where the color change generally occurs for these kind of um, indicators for redox titrations. So a redox indicator will give a satisfactory endpoint when the difference in the formal potential is going to be um, less than 0 0.4 volts. And so sometimes it is possible to use color change indicators for that. Um,